Hello, I'm Laura McPhee, a reporter at Pensions Insight and Engaged Investor Magazines, and I'm here with Pensions Minister Steve Webb. Hello, Steve. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Good. Are you enjoying the conference? Yes, it's been a bit of a flying visit, but uh, I've enjoyed the, uh, the question and answer sessions. Good. Well, we're very happy to have you here. I just had a couple of questions for you um, about the ideas you've come up with so far in your time as Pensions Minister. First of all, there's defined ambition. And I was just wondering what you think the appetite is for risk sharing. I think a lot depends on where you're coming from as an employer. If you've only ever had pure DC, you put your money in and you walk away, then taking on more risk may not look very attractive. But if you're an employer who's had DB in the past, who wants to do more than the bare minimum, they're looking for a space that's affordable, that's predictable, but that is better than just the minimum. And I think that's what we have to facilitate. Great. And when can we expect the next white paper on defined ambition and what do you expect it to contain? So we floated some ideas before Christmas just to get the ideas started really and we've been talking to a lot of people since then. So in the summer we'll put out something that's a bit firmer, suggest some of the ideas that are gaining traction, thinks through some of the practicalities and obviously we're talking to firms who are deciding what to choose for auto enrolment and how to respond to the end of contracting out. So those two are making corporate Britain think very hard about their pension plans so this is just the time to be making sure the new structure is in place. And what's your view of managed DC? I think one of the challenges is if you simply reduce risk through investment strategy, clearly that, that's helpful, you're reducing volatility, but trying to communicate to people that their outcome isn't certain, it's just a bit less uncertain than it was, is a, is a tough call. And one of the things I like about the sort of money back guarantee type ideas that I've advocated is the absolute clarity of the message. It's that the money that goes in will be there at the end and that's an awful lot easier than you know what goes in could still go up or go down but it's less likely to go up or down than it was before. It's a harder message to sell. Sure. And you mentioned in your speech that you didn't want to find ambition to be too prescriptive because too much regulation gets in the way. So what would you think of the idea of having a single pensions regulator? I think the, the, the challenge of having one regulator is that we've already had regulatory upheaval with the FSA being split into two. If in the middle of automatic enrolment you then start trying to combine regulators, I think there is a risk of a great deal of turmoil and a period of uncertainty. And one of the problems is, you know, just because they have one name, not two, just because they're in one building, not two, doesn't mean you've got effective regulation. So we have to make sure that whether it is a combined one or separate ones, that the workplace pension provision regulation and the occupational provision regulation is joined up and is coherent, you know, almost regardless of whether what name there is over the door plate. Great. And we've also been talking about small pots this morning. So why did the government choose to use the pot follows member approach rather than having a single aggregator? One of our worries about having an aggregator is if you have a very small pot size limit, so only very small pots go off to an aggregator, well that's fine, that, that just gets rid of all the, all the dross in the system, but it doesn't really give you consolidation because all you have to have is a slightly bigger pot and you've got one here, one there, one there. And if you have a high pot size limit for the aggregator, then suddenly it sucks in vast amounts from all over the place and comes this giant in the industry and in the market and people start saying, hang on, this is unbalanced and, and so on. And we took the view that a better strategy is for have individuals engaged with their own pension saving, pot following them, building up to a more worthwhile amount, not vulnerable to active member discounts from schemes they've left or deferred member charges as it were. And, and that seemed to us a more coherent way of doing things and if we can make pension transfers work and be cheaper and, and more cost effective that's of, of wider benefit. Great, but are you worried that employers might struggle to explain this approach to their employees? Well, for us, we want minimal involvement from employers in this process. We don't want a new burden or cost for firms. This is about schemes. So what happens is you leave firm A and scheme A, you go to firm B and scheme B, and scheme B checks if you've got a stranded pot, writes to you and says, you've got this pot of money somewhere else. Unless you stop us, we'll bring it into scheme B. You say, that's fine. Or in other words, you do, you do nothing. The firm isn't really involved in this. And because we're talking relatively small amounts of money, it shouldn't be necessary to have advice. You know, this should be a cheap, simple process. Right. And as you say, we are talking about quite small amounts of money. Pot size is under £10,000. So do you think it's misleading to talk about big, fat pots? 
I suppose you just try to try and communicate what, what it is you're doing and all we're really saying is instead of having 2,000 here and 3,000 here and 5,000 here, it accumulates into something worthwhile and obviously, you know, £10,000 doesn't buy you much of a pension, I, I understand that, but we're just simply trying to get the idea that you consolidate pension saving and that that could get you better value for money and then people might voluntarily consolidate other pension saving, they obviously need to think about that, so my goal is that people have one or a few genuinely big fat pots and this is part of that mechanism. Brilliant. And one more thing we've talked about this morning is auto-enrolment, of course. What do you make of the figures that have come out so far on opt-out rates and do you think that's likely to change as the smaller employers reach their staging dates? I think the, the early results are unambiguously encouraging, you know, very low rates of opt-out. Obviously you have to be slightly careful because opt-out means something very specific. It means in the first month putting the clock back as if this had never happened. Clearly some people will stay in for a month or two and then drop out, so we need to keep an eye on, on the drop out as it were, not just the opt-out. But so far the sense is people knew they needed a pension but needed someone to take the hassle away from it, value the employer contribution and you know the employers I think have done a good job in communicating the value of pensions so so far so good but we can't take for granted that will happen down down the scale so we need to make sure people are enrolled into quality schemes and then then we will see but so far so good. And just one final question does the government currently have any plans to lift the restrictions on NEST? Well, we did a call for evidence on the nest restrictions and we got quite a lot of feedback. One of, one of the challenges is, in a sense, this early stage of automatic enrolment, many firms uh, have used other schemes or have used nest for just part of their workforce. So the evidence on the impact of the charge uh, constraints and so on and, and, and the cap is, is not absolutely clear. But we're looking very hard at the feedback we got from that and hopefully later in the year we'll be able to set out what our conclusions are. But I think nest is already doing a good job in influencing the market. I think it's raised quality, I think it's brought charges down and the crucial thing is it needs to be able to continue to do